Hello, hello, and welcome to the Horse Geeks podcast, where we look at horses and riders from the inside out. And today's topic is going to be exactly on that, how, the, how we can look at a body as an operating system and what we do with that body as software. So I'm Kirsten Nelson, professional horse trainer uh, for Wexford Training and developer of the program Training for Optimal Balance. And with me is the lovely Deb Cooper. Uh, she's a orthopedic massage therapist, Alexander Technique instructor, and uh, her business or the founder of Optimal Posture. So, and a quick note, this is our third podcast. We love doing it. Um, on the very first podcast, I set it up on the wrong YouTube channel. So I'm just making a little announcement again that if you want to follow the podcast or you want to follow Horse Geeks, please subscribe to any of the videos other than podcast one. So you can <laughs> two last week or you can click the Number two and on. And, Number and, two. Yeah. So podcast two or three, if you hit the subscribe button on these podcasts, it will subscribe okay. you to the correct YouTube channel. We're always learning. What can I say? <laughs> so other than that, let's get on with um, operating systems and software programs in the body. So this metaphor or comparison sort of evolved um, because trying to describe what I do as a horse trainer has always been a challenge. It's just a challenge. And so there's lots of ways I say uh, it's an internal perspective versus an external perspective, but what does that mean? So we all live with computers now and people understand that your computer has an operating system and the operating system receives constant updates, right? So we don't always work with the same operating system. And that to me is what I work on as a horse trainer because all horses and riders share the same anatomy and the same instinct. So horses have a prey animal instinct, which is different than a human predatory instinct. Horses are quadrupeds where their balance is horizontal and riders are bipeds. So our balance is more vertical, but the anatomy and the instinct between all people is the same and the anatomy and instinct between all horses is the same. So that's what I look at as the operating system. The software is what we do, right? So learning the, the movements of dressage or learning how to ride a jump course or even getting good on trail riding or driving a cart, um, doesn't matter if it's a Western discipline, English discipline, polo, racing, whatever. Learning about that sport to me is the software program that you run with the operating system. And you can have, you might need updates to your software program. That's why you need coaches who specialize in a sport and competitive co coaches. But if you're trying to run the software with a very glitchy, outdated, slow operating system. Like I don't use the same computer I used 10 years ago. I have a much better operating system and lots of new software, but it, it, and it keeps working better. It keeps becoming more efficient. It keeps working better. So that was a metaphor that I think people really could grasp. That as a trainer, I'm focused on the operating system where somebody who's gonna train you in jumping, racing, dressage, all of that is the software program that you run. And so fixing, upgrading the operating system helps run any software program more efficiently. It runs, so that's where this whole idea kind of came from. And then in the Alexander technique, like we talked about in the last podcast, the whole theory and premise is the same as what I'm doing with horses. Yes, exactly. And, and do we as humans ever think about updating or challenging or questioning our operating system? 
I don't think we do. <laughs> I don't think we, well, maybe Alexander teachers do. I don't know if we call it that, but like you said earlier, we're constantly learning. We're constantly, it's never a destination. It's always about the, the how we get there. How do we get there? Um, but that brought it up to me just now. It's like, wow, do humans ever think how their operating systems in, c affect what they do and how their day goes, positive or negative? Because it's either positive or negative, the way you use your body. It's not neutral. It is not a neutral place. And um, constantly questioning by having, like you said, some sort of a teacher, some either another set of hands, which as an Alexander teacher, I mostly do hands on, but also another set of eyes because our, our operating systems, like you said, may need to be updated and we're not aware of it. No, and, and at a certain point, even with our computers, there's no more updates that that particular machine could handle because it's outdated. And it's like, no, you might need to really look at a big upgrade to be able to run more efficiently, which if you think of it, it like every cell in our body has been completely replaced every seven years. So I go, our body, the natural organic process of just being alive, is a constant regeneration and rejuvenation of every cell in our body. And even I think in sports medicine for people, there's a center in Florida over in Bradenton, Florida that I can't remember the name of it right now, but they have a center where they're working on biomechanics for professional athletes. And athletes of all disciplines around the world go there to learn better biomechanics with their own body, better biomechanical use, which is exactly what Alexander Technique is. And it's where I specialize as a trainer for horses and riders. And it's not well known. I wouldn't say it's the most prevalent part of sports medicine or body work or horse training, but I think it's gaining a little bit more ground because people are, are realizing the no pain, no gain, mm -hmm. right? Or just do it till you fall down, <laughs> creates so many neg negative <laughs> side effects. <laughs> yeah, that was, I was, as you were talking, that's exactly what I was thinking. So here are these elite athletes that are constantly pushing the envelope and questioning how they use their body to do what they want to do and why is it most of us humans are oh I'm okay I'm, I, I got it <laughs> until we have that pain in our neck or pain in our back that tells us well then we usually focus on the problem instead of on the symptom instead of the actual problem which is the operating system itself it has been challenged for quite some time. And it's that one thing that just, you know, it's that straw that breaks the camel's back. It's that, oh, all of a sudden my horse is lame. But how long has an underlying current been disrupted? And we just haven't noticed it because we don't have the, 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 conscious bringing the unconscious and looking at how we're actually moving how the horse is actually moving from the spine and how it affects the entire body right no and it's kind of what we talked about last time those kind of three basic perceptions that we talked about with balance is i'm not falling over which can, would be a complete <laughs> fail right if the horse fell over or we fall over that's a complete failure of the system. So that's kind of the first level of the perception is, well, I'm not falling over, so I must be in balance, right? <laughs> and then even if you're an athlete or the horse is an athlete, it's like, well, we're getting the job done. That's the next layer, right? But in that getting the job done layer, you get this small repetitive stresses and strains of even though you're getting the job done, the operating system is getting glitchy 
And it's, it's like when you defrag your computer or you run a, you know, an upgrade or an update, it's like, it gets rid of the bugs and the glitches, right? So even elite athletes training further, I don't think we would ever stop in this lifetime learning how to better use our operating system. You know, and if, you, if you think about it, the position of your body is determined and that with gravity. So if you're challenging your body already against gravity because of not good use, what happens when you add a moving object underneath you and right. gravity and your position or posture, whatever word you wanna use, um, is compromised even slightly. I mean, it's kind of like when you build a house, if you're an inch off at one end, you're six inches off on the other end. Yes. Yeah. Yes. No, and it, it makes me think a bit again, kind of thinking of balance, like we talked about last time, but <clears throat> it's really, <clears throat> for me, balance is in the realm of physics. I go, we have Newton's laws of motion that are just pure physics describing the forces that we actually experience every day. I go, you don't have to know the math. You actually experience the force or energy required to throw a baseball, right? Or to ride a cantering horse or a galloping horse, or even to balance on a horse on the trails. I go, the motion bodies generate forces of motion. And so balance to me is an integration of opposing forces, like too fast, too slow, but balance is controlled forward energy between too fast and too slow. If you have too much force going too fast, it can't control itself. So you lose balance or like horses that don't wanna go forward. They're resisting forward, they don't like it. And so you have too much braking force. And again, that doesn't feel good either. So the braking pushing balance of forward energy, just like in our car, is a constant minute adjustment managing the forces of motion. I'm right. And I, I like the, the analogy of say, walking a dog on a leash. And we've got internal forces that we're managing within ourselves. But then if that dog tugs on the leash, we have an external force that it's, it's not just pulling on our arm. Our whole body has to respond yes. to that tug on the leash. It's not just my arm because if it was just my arm and I didn't use some sort of muscular activity tone in my body, I'd fall. Or you would get a shoulder injury or a wrist injury. Right, right, right. So it's not just your seat on the horse. It's not just your arms or your legs. It's, it's this whole continuum of responses going on to all the internal and external forces. Yeah, or even a horse leaning on the bit. A horse that's heavy on the bit or needs a more leveraged bit. I go, lightness is the result lightness on the reins and the bit is the result of the back muscles balancing those forward forces of breaking and pushing, go and whoa. And so the heaviness on the bit is the same like the dog on the leash. It's generating a force on our entire body, not just our arms, right? And some people I've heard say, you know, I need to go to the gym or this is a man's mm -hmm. horse, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it's really because the force of the horse's motion is imbalanced. And so the weight of the horse's body is what you're feeling in your hands. So thinking of balance just really as managing these forces directly related to Newton's laws of motion. It, it's not, it's the same in a car, right? But with a living body, there is a lot more sort of conversation that has to go on. There's a little, there could be a fear element, an uncertainty element, um, a pain element um, that, that isn't, it's more complex than just driving a car. 
but the laws of motion are the same. Yeah, the, the, it's the, um, but you bring up those, those um, pain, fear, and in the Alexander Technique Science.com, they actually have a, their definition of balance. Their first two words are, it's a behavior. So, yeah, because I think behavior is a good word. It encompasses mental, emotional, and physical. I think that's a really good word that you say it's the behavior of basically managing forces. And I love what you said, there's internal forces. So our operating system, which is really, I would say is our balance is a huge part of the operating system, but how we manage forces is directed by our central nervous system primarily. And that's the heart of the operating system of the body. So like habits, I go, that's the operating system is, go, is the nervous system, which is going to create the coordination of, of motion, right? So that coordination of the skeleton in motion directed by the nervous system, then that movement of the skeleton dictates the muscle use, which muscles we put a lot of tone or tension in, which ones we overuse, which ones we underuse, how the forces are acting through every joint in the body as well is dependent on central nervous system coordinating the skeleton, then the use of the soft tissue, not only muscle, but tendon and ligament. And so you think of this complex system that if, the spine is dysfunctional or the central nervous system has a habit of movement that isn't really putting a, it, it's putting too much concussion say, and this is a personal one, my right knee, right? <laughs> so the right knee is where I get the pain if I arch my lumbar and twist to the right because I have a habit of doing that in my low back that I had to become very conscious of. But where I thought I needed an MRI and injections in my knee, as soon as you helped me straighten my own lumbar, the knee pain went away instantly. And I go, so you came along and went, no, no, here's the glitch in your operating system. <laughs> We're gonna put in a patch or an update or change the code and bingo. Yeah. That helped the knee problem. Yeah. And, and the brain kind of works that way too. I mean, they, they haven't really, to my knowledge right now, come up with if there's two separate operating systems that run posture and movement, there's still haven't done enough studies on, are they separate, but they definitely talk to each other. So there was something you said about the brain versus the spinal cord activity in static versus motion. What was, can you talk about right. that? Right, a little, yeah. So, and they're just delving into this kind of research um, that they're finding that for posture, uh, which they consider more of a tonic using tone, it's coming more from the central nervous system to maintain that. But as soon as we go into a movement, that is a brain function. Yeah. And they're also finding that um, there's, I guess you could kind of call it almost like mirroring. So if maybe the, the, the brain is constantly watching, um, say what you do to pick up your, your cup with your left hand and we'll, and we'll try to anticipate the next movement that you might do with your right hand. So it's, I know it's really fascinating. And, and so the Alexander technique, we're really asking or questioning that, that pre-programmed plan of how, how, when I get a stimulus, whether it's, I think we were taught, you know, whether it's the tug on the leash or, or it could be a visual stimulus. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what it is. 
what is our habitual response or reaction? You have a choice to respond or react. And can I interrupt that and find something new? And I think that's what you're doing with the horses is you're kind of saying, no, not that. That's not exactly what I'm asking for. <laughs> Try again. Right. And I, I call it sort of interrupting the misuse, like only creating resistance where there's a misuse. You can't, it's the body is so complex. It's like, you can't make a little kid learn how to ride a bike at a certain point. And, and for us ourselves, nobody can hold you there to learn the coordination of riding a bike or driving a car or learning to swim. Um, and all of those are things that we all learned. We weren't born. We even learned how to walk at a certain point in our life. We weren't born walking, right? And so that mirroring, like watching the people around you, I think is part of how we just pick up habits of motion. Uh, I totally agree. And that's what the, uh, and the brain recognition, it's there. They're saying, yeah, that's what's going on. And it could be, if you look at, if you look at um, the, the way models walk or hold themselves, and if you, that is not necessarily great use of the human body for that purpose, but people pick up on it mm -hmm. and will use that. Wanting to walk like a model. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, and it's, uh, I think it brings up an interesting point that when you want to make upgrades to your operating system, you, we, all of us are the programmer. Like I go, okay, we are the programmer as well as the user of the operating system. And to become the programmer, you need information. You need to, up, you know, you update your knowledge. So you become a better programmer. But the only way you can reprogram something or do an upgrade is that moment of becoming it, like keeping a certain part of your brain in an observational state of yourself and pausing if you need to go slow to go how is it i do this because once we have habits it's like we it's unconscious there's already that program running in our body that says this is how i pick up my coffee cup and i might go this is how i pick up my <laughs> Right? Ow, ow. <laughs> <I know. laughs> and that might be my habit, but I could go, right. you know, maybe I could rearrange myself. So I actually mm -hmm. stay more stable here and I use my arm, but it just took me twice as long to pick up my coffee cup, right? But less wear and tear to my body. So to do that programming or that reprogramming is there's a lot of pausing mm -hmm. to become aware. I go, but we're all capable of observation and awareness. It's just that if we get in a hurry or we don't think about it, if our mind is in, ahead in the future or in the past, we're not really present with our current use. And I think that's a big part of it is just kind of, especially for riders, becoming really present on what it, what are the forces that are acting on your body from the horse right now? And how are you responding? What's going on internally? How are you managing those forces? Could we find a better way of force management that's maybe easier, feels easier in your body, changes any pain issue, Right. So and and relieve soreness from overuse of muscles, stuff like that. So being the programmer who has to write the upgrades is why <laughs> it's a little tricky. Right. And then there's things you're never going to figure out on your own. So like even a friend of mine who was doing um, Ironmans, right, his swimming was the hardest 
of the, of the triathlon and he wanted to improve his swim time. So even though he's super athletic and a really good swimmer, I think he read a book or got a coach who basically changed the use of his back and how he used the arms. And that was it. It was just instead of, instead of, I don't know, keeping your fingers straight on the back push with your arm, you cup your hand, or I don't remember what it was. I could be dead wrong. But just the little change in use increased his time without building more muscle, without more practice. <laughs> it like instantly increased his swim time in a substantial way. And you know what is interesting, just hearing you say that, what was his original stimulus? It was to better his time. Yeah. It wasn't to better his body. <laughs> it wasn't to better his body and it wasn't uh -huh. because he had pain. Right. It was, he wanted a competitive edge. Right. And so that's what a good operating system and software upgrades give to an athlete you need yes. both yeah and it it would be highly helpful in our whole community if we even thought that we all need that yes not just the athlete not just the horse but the the rider really needs to look at how they're using their own body and how that in, influences the horse well, and ironically, even though I went this direction, understanding the operating system as we're talking about it in a horse, my original intent was to improve my performance for showing. <laughs> I took a big left turn at the fork in the road you did. <laughs> and ended up specializing in behavioral problems and lameness <laughs> because it, I, it, it helped, it made my heart feel good. It was where my heart was to help horses that other people were saying was they were unhelpable, that they weren't gonna change. They were trash, they were done. They were horses not worth spending time on, which broke my heart. And so all of this information that I originally intended to learn as a performance advantage, I was like, oh my God, the horses with who are really struggling with behavioral issues and lameness issues, they need this information more than any other performance horse. I go, it helps the performance edge tremendously. And that's why there's this whole center in Bradenton, Florida for all, all professional athletes of all types, because it does give you an edge in performance. But I went, it's the only way to get through some of these super challenging dangerous horses, behavioral issues, and really significant lameness issues. I go, it's that horse's only way out of the problem. And so that's the direction I went in my business because there was a big need and not a lot of people offering that. And it made me feel good. So <laughs> I, I, love, I love the turnaround work on horses, you know, kind of at their last chance, according to the rest of the horse world. So. And, and, and what it's, um, and we were talking about this yesterday that, and it's very hard to explain, but when you start unpeeling the layers in the horse or the human of the dysfunction, oh. Oh. It, the, the horse becomes a different horse um the some of those quote unquote behavioral problems aren't there anymore they just evaporate it evaporates and the same with people you can think about um you know the worst case scenario is somebody with a walker that they have lost all spinal integrity the fear of falling comes up and this whole snowball can go on yeah and they become very defensive Yes. You know, some of some will go the direction of fight and get really crabby and cantankerous <laughs> and others will go the direction of flight and be sort of nervous and anxious all the time as people, you know? Yes. Yeah. Because our bodies, I think, really alert us when we're not in a healthy, stable relationship to gravity. If we're listening, 
Yeah, if we're listening, um, that and and when you start peeling those layers and the central nervous system starts to recognize peace, ease, there's this overwhelming quality. Uh, I call some people when I'm working with them, I'll, I'll say, oh my gosh, all the wrinkles are gone from your face. <laughs> yes, I had and it's like. It's like the central nervous system goes, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and the horse is the same. So like some of these horses with chronic behavioral problems, I go, it's really, I don't think humans understand how much it's a learned skill for a horse to carry a rider in whatever activity, not just com competition. I go, this is an unnatural weight and mass on their back. And how we ride is either sort of, like you said, it's never neutral. It's mm -hmm. either small, repetitive challenges, stresses, strains, or, or like not, uh, not detrimental, but just stressful, or it's constructive. And you're sort of going in the direction of really strengthening the system of the body and for horses to carry riders is a we we need to help them learn a much higher coordination than nature intended. It, it has to be, it's not natural to a horse to carry a rider. And so we can't rely on the fact that just because they're not falling over, they've got it. it it's a higher coordination of the body, just like we're talking about with these athletes learning more control over their own operating system, same for the horse. And without that, we have just a, a huge problem with idiopathic lameness issues, mm -hmm. with behavioral issues, with horses that are like done and retiring at 12 years old uh, or getting joint injections under 10 years old because it's so stressful to their bodies. And I go, that to me is just sad and tragic and not necessary, just not necessary. But it, it's, it's like, if we tweaked the basics a little and understood for us as riders and for horses, the horses have to learn a higher coordination to carry a rider than they ever would learn in nature. So that's the challenge in owning a horse, riding a horse, but it's also the benefit to the horse. A horse can live longer, be stronger, and have a better coordination with a human than they ever would find in nature. So that's sort of the gift we have to our horses, if we love our horses, that's what we give back to them, as well as working on ourselves. And the ease they feel in their body, it's like, all of those little frustrations and behavioral issues, they just sort of drop off. Mm -hmm. They just go away without any direct problem solving training. You know, it's like, I don't have to address the problem. They just don't have it anymore. Yeah, and I, you know, with one of my horses, Callie, <laughs> her, her nickname was Airs Above the Ground. <laughs> She spent, she spent most of her time off of her feet and, and she's like 17 and a half hands warm yeah up. she's she's yeah. not she's not a pony and i'm vertically challenged as it is so um and to see this horse uh this was maybe last summer i i don't really have an arena i was out in the paddock pasture riding and the UPS driver comes down the road, the dog's chasing the UPS truck and barking. She didn't even flinch. She was like, I'm on this. I, this is much more important than that UPS truck. Yes, yeah. yeah <laughs> went, wow, have... we're getting somewhere. Yeah. But that would have in the past, that would have been a, I better jump off now, grab the grab strap, hang on, bend her to a stop moment. Absolutely. Yeah, there would have been a snort and then an airs above the ground after that. <laughs> no, and I remember her. We've known each other a long time. And when she was <laughs> in that phase of highly defensive, she's scary. She's a big <laughs> scary. She's a big <laughs> scary. <laughs> and, you know, and that's so hard as the rider to 
maintain your own self-control to say that that's not about me, that's about her. I need to help her. I yes. need to be I need to be her best teacher. And so then I better be using myself to the best I can use myself to help her. Absolutely. And she was like totally my cup of tea kind of horse. <laughs> no amount of leverage was going to fix the problem. Not at all. Not only was she big and powerful and defensive, but if you tried to use leverage, it only got worse. Yeah, it, it was, was much like, worse. Here's a, that's why a lot of people don't like mares. I go, that's a good point. And, and they don't, and they can't work with stallions. I go, mares and stallions are just intact. So you have the hormone factor that just makes everything bigger. And Callie was a great, great horse in that she had a strong sense of self-preservation. Very strong. And if you tried to muscle her around, and it's like the horse I work with, Hercules, he got that name because this horse can out push any amount of leverage you could come up with. <laughs> I just go, it wasn't gonna happen until you got into the operating system. You have to get in and it's the same with people. You have to finally be willing to look at your habits and be given the tools to change those habits yeah. on a constant basis because it's not, oh, I've got it. It's it. This is forever. This is a lifelong learning process Absolutely. that I've always got to evaluate and look at. Could I do it different? Could I do it? with better use. Yes. And I think too, uh, it made this made me conversation made me think of something in that we are the programmer who upgrades our operating system. But when we ride a horse, the horse has to be the programmer of its own operating system as well. We are only the coach. Right? right. So it's like the teacher with you as an Alexander instructor, when you put hands on me, you're not tweaking my operating system as the programmer. You're guiding me, teaching me how to become a better programmer. Right. And when you ride horses. There's still this prevalent thought that we are the programmer of the horse's movement. And I go, oh, start digging into biomechanics and you realize there's no effing way you can control a biomechanical system. We as riders cannot reprogram the horse. We can only teach the horse how to become its own programmer, to reprogram itself. And that's what, when we were talking about Cali, it, it's like, if you use leverage thinking you're gonna put her in balance, Oh, that was a lesson all by itself. <laughs> <laughs> that is not going to happen. But as you guided her towards more like what correct function or better function upgrading your operating system gives the body is ease, comfort, alleviating repetitive stress and strain, putting the right amount of concussive forces in the right body part working the muscles that are meant to take that work. And so working with Callie and all horses are this way, she was just more extreme, but it's always about ease. And, sorry, Lily. <laughs> cat photo bomb. <laughs> it's a cat, right? Um, so it's always about the better we get at managing our own operating system, thinking of the central nervous system first, the spinal coordinations and functions, that that leads to ease, pain relief, alleviation of concussive forces, strengthening maybe body parts that had atrophied. And so that's the only way in with a horse like Callie that you showed her how to find more ease and more ease and more ease and more stability. And then she's like, yeah, I would rather work on this than what I feel like when I get scared of the UPS truck. Exactly. 
making that choice because she feels better to work with you than she does to go back into that, you know, spinal extension, fight, flight, tight muscle mm -hmm. feeling. Not that it doesn't happen, but it, it takes more and more for them to want to go back to that terrible feeling in their body rather yeah. than stay with the good feelings of their body. And that's exactly. really in a nutshell, how I work with behavioral issues. I go because mm -hmm. there's other than a horse having a bad experience, which to me is a small problem to work through a horse's abusive history or bad history because horses really let it go pretty fast. I find their main issue is in the realm of physical movement and that most behavior, there's a direct relationship between the expression of struggle or defensiveness or um, pain, stress, anything is expressed through behavior because horses are not very verbal, but the issue is misuse of the axial skeleton, the spine, the skull, even the pelvis, the, the thorax, and or instability, mm -hmm. right? That carrying a rider makes them feel so unstable that they react. So, so I would say the bulk of what we call behavioral problems or even the horse being resistant, lazy, crazy, all of those sort of I say character assassinations that we give our horses. <laughs> <laughs> and we do like to label them, don't we? Oh, yes, we do. Because then we don't have to think further. Yeah, we don't yeah. have to deal with it. That's that. And it's her fault. It's his fault. It, you know, it's a mare. It's a thoroughbred. It's a, you know, it's like everybody else's fault rather than you go, okay, maybe it is. But what are you going to do about it? How can I help? What am I doing? Am I helping? Am I, am I helping or not? Or making it worse. Exactly. I yeah. always have to ask that question. Yes. Yeah. So anything else you want to add? I think um, I, I just jotted down a couple of notes, but it was like, you know, balance, thinking of balance as always a management of forces whether they're internal forces or <clears throat> external forces yeah so balance. it's not a, it's not a place it's not a place no. it's not a destination it's a continuum of oh, i will have to it on one of these podcasts i'll have to pull up an image of a gimbal so a gimbal is like a device that it, they use it a lot with movie cameras to keep the camera from shaking especially if you're mm -hmm. moving while you're filming um and it's like a stabilizer but it's always moving it's constantly adjusting in order to keep the center stable and it's a it's a great tool to kind of look at and go ah the central nervous system is the stable point but our whole body is adjusting constantly to maintain the stability in the middle it should be <laughs> and at the highest level of balance, that's what I mean. The highest understanding of balance is that it's managing forces in multiple directions. Yes, exactly. Internal and external forces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then um, I think balance is part of the operating system of the body. <clears throat> Right? I and agree. The system, we could look at the biomechanics of the body. We could look at force management of the body. We could look at all kinds of things. Um, but that really is the operating system. And then the software is what we do. And when I took Alexander Technique lessons, I go, I never thought about getting in and out of a chair. <laughs> I never thought about how I eat my food. I never thought about how I walk from point A to point B or how I drive in my car. Like all of those were things I would do that I never thought about. And the Alexander Technique lessons made me think about those things. And I'm like, oh, it's all the time, not sometimes. It's, it's all the time. All the time. Even in your sleep. <laughs> yes. But we don't want to go into that. That's difficult. So leave that one alone. 
Yeah, but even in our daily routine, I discovered I could put my brain in the mode of observer, mm -hmm. even while I was actively doing. And I could just start to think, am I stressing out my neck, my shoulder, my back? Am I using a stable center as I reach to pick up my phone? Right? So it's like, as I put it back down, am I doing that? Am I <laughs> breaking my neck? Am I? <laughs> right. Or somewhere in the, on the YouTube channel, somewhere is the lesson you did with me. Because when I first got on Zoom, I was like, why? Or no, I think it was this. <laughs> Why do I like why, that? why do I why do I drop that shoulder like that? Why do I twick my neck like that? Yeah. Yeah, when you're on Zoom and you see yourself, you're like, what's that all about? <laughs> How long have I been doing that? It's a great mirror device, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think being our own programmers, one of the most important things we can do is slow down pause so as soon as we just as soon as we're in the mode of something that's habitual like even driving our car we're listening to the radio or talking to somebody or you know looking at where we're going or um you know looking at the gps or whatever hearing the direction coordinates and we're not thinking about how we're sitting in the seat how are we using our legs on the gas in the accelerator are we pulling the steering wheel towards us like that kind of driving or are we relaxed in our arms you know maybe even and i played with rain contact first by sort of learning to drive pushing on my steering wheel realizing that i had been sort of pulling on my steering wheel and yes. also because of the alexander technique did i even like think ask the question yeah <laughs> just if people would just ask themselves the question yeah. What about this? Or how do uh, I do that? How do I do that? How do I do that? Yeah. Because, and especially as adult learners with horses, it's been a long time since we were having to explore our body. Mm -hmm. So like when children, I always like up until the age of 12 is the highest or fastest rate of growth in the human body. So if you think about how fast kids are growing, up to sort of early teenage years, what's happening in the body and what makes kids pick up bike riding, swimming, horseback riding, athletic stuff, the reason they're so fast picking it up is because their bodies are always unstable. And that's, to me, that's what balance is, managing being unstable. Yeah, and it, because it, the bones it, themselves are still changing the physics of movement on a daily basis, it's like they can adapt and find stability in the context of even the internal forces of the bones changing length. I go, that's huge. And they never, they never say, oh, I got it. You know, they're always going, oh, new possibility. Oh, oh, look at that. Oh, look at that. Yeah. And then late in teenage years is where we start to solidify into our habits. But when I work with adult beginner riders who are, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, doesn't matter, even 20s. It's like those habits are so established mm -hmm. that it's, it's in a way, I try to work with bringing the rider back to that childlike quality of not expecting, not knowing, not question, knowing. Okay. questioning how you do things is how you start to reprogram your operating system. Yes. And kids, I never have that conversation because it's like they're already in that self-aware experimentation mode because their whole little growing body and all of us went through it. Their whole little growing body is still in flux. It's never the same every day. Yeah. So anyways, that was the last note I wanted to make and we can wrap it up. OK. Anything you want to add? No. Just keep asking questions. <laughs> yeah. And thank you everyone for joining us.
uh, hit subscribe if you like the podcast. We're going to start doing these a little bit more often. And we'll see you next time. Be kind, everyone. All right. Yes. Bye. Bye.